one cross stitch. The crow call retreats into its throat and trees rescind their chlorophyll and the red, blue, red lights withdraw the stains and the curtains and nothing remains but that ghost of a leaf, a bit of brown lace slipped to a shiny black boot. Two, folk song. What is left to say when lies have removed our tongues? Not a hint of sweetness in the milk seeping from the cut fig's stem. Three, quilt. Today's pattern will stitch together glass wing butterflies, razor wire crowns, and apologies for its sentimentality. The children are sleeping under foil blankets on concrete slabs, urine damp and unable to touch each other. What calculus solves for X times Y equals a six-year-old defending herself in immigration court when she should be making foil crowns and dreaming of glass wings lifting her skyward. Four, drum corps. The Cardinal dives into her own reflection, defending her territory, mistaking self for enemy. Again and again, whole body collisions pounding the sheet glass like a bass drum while the growing crowd shouts, someone stop her, someone stop her or she'll break her neck. Five, barn dance. Today's caller takes the shape of a child who emerged from the fault line after the earthquake everyone knew would come. Her cobweb teeth, her leaded eyes. She carries a lambskin scroll we all need to read, but we're busy tallying our damages, waiting for the underwriter while the hold music drones, while the hold music drones. So the funny thing about being white is that other white people will say things to you assuming that you agree with them. <laughs> and then there's an opportunity for education and clarification. Um, so there's this question that I've been asked before, like, oh, sure, you're pro-immigration, but who do you want as your neighbors? And because I'm a poet, I get to respond publicly. <laughs> <laughs> But who do you want as your neighbors? The one who made her scarf into a baby sling and carried her toddler 300 miles on foot. The one who salvaged four planks from a lean-to, turned a bed sheet into a sail and called it a boat. The one who filled the baby's bellies with songs about the food they could eat when they got there. The ones who crossed the ocean in a 51 Chevy pickup fastened to oil drum pontoons. The ones who lashed plastic bottles to a grid of bamboo stalks and christened it hope. The one who poured his last drops of water between his sister's chapped lips. The ones who whispered, keep going, almost there, a few more days. The one who taped the soles of her broken shoes onto a stranger's bleeding feet. The one who made room on the crowded train roof for more ones. The ones who traveled together because we're safer that way. The ones who made mattresses of their bodies so their children could sleep, who ignored the rocks gouging into their backs by counting innumerable stars. So around the time of the, um, there were hearings for um, justice in quotation marks Kavanaugh. Um, and what was happening during that time was that some, some people were learning for the first time that your behavior couldn't be poor, but you can still be um, promoted to one of the most important positions in the United States. 
And that's really distressing when you learn about it for the first time. So I was giving a reading, um, actually, along with one of the professors who teaches here, Katie Ziegler. And uh, it felt like it was important to read this poem out loud that day because it's when, when people were really hurting uh, and really concerned and questioning. Um, and those of us who are over the age of 50, shout out to those of us over the thank you, <laughs> are like, oh, we've seen this before. <laughs> um, and I realized that not everybody had. So maybe it was time to, to uh, reach out to people who were going through this experience for the first time. Instructions for breaking. Listen, there has always been light. There has always been a congregation of lights. There has always been a place in the dark where we'll meet you. There has always been a handprint pressed into a wall over the prints of those who arrived before under the hands of those who will follow waiting for yours. There has always been, there will always be a voice calling against the cacophony of voices, your name until you hear it and sing it back to us. Listen, there have always been wing beats and heartbeats and spoons whipping batter in bowls and fists kneading dough and truth as the wind has chosen to tell it in the tapping of one finger on a desk in the lamplight while everyone else sleeps. Love, you must listen to the coordinates. Place and time. When the next gathering begins is always now. Join us or do not, but hear me, you are never alone. Now y'all do. <laughs> I get to this point where I'm like, I've heard my voice enough. How are you? Somebody want to shout out their uh, favorite song or something? Favorite author? Sports team? I will say we have three poems up here. We're going to take a poem and their refreshments, I think. So that. Yeah, if anybody can get a cookie yeah. or coffee right now, you can't beat it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're both free. Go get it. Go get it. <laughs> I got no answers on favorite music, on favorite authors. On okay. Nice. Yes. Okay. So I'm reading one of his books right now. Um, and I just read his memoir uh, about a, mm, three or four months ago. So tell me what you like about him. Oh, my brother and I. Oh, I love that. Oh, you're the guy. You're the one who does that still. <laughs> <laughs> that gives me hope. <laughs> I, I meet a lot of people who don't really think that there's a place for books anymore. Um, and that makes me really sad. So thank you. Anyone else? Favorite authors or okay, music? Hit me with some favorite music. You have to listen to music. music. What? Favorite TikTok <laughs> creator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like moving down the scale. <laughs> no sports fans, nothing. You got nothing for me. They're, you're like, hey, you're here to read. <laughs> Do your work, poet. <laughs> Um, so, is anybody familiar with the Beatles at all? Okay, a little bit of familiarity with the Beatles. And there's a Beatles song that's called um, The Octopus's Garden. Okay, so I have this tendency, it's just the way my brain works. Um, it's kind of like a collage in here all the time. So if I hear one thing over here from this area and I hear something else over here from this area and something else over here from this, they tend to like tell a story all together in my head. And so I um, I'm getting, I'm, wasn't planning on reading this poem, but I'm gonna read it because somebody asked a question about it. And the question is, um, I am fascinated by how you weave scientific fact and dictionary definitions and the creation story of the Beatles song, Octopus Garden, all together. 
and they're asking about what was the inspiration for this. So I'm going to just go for it with this and then I can talk about inspiration afterward. And this is a weird ass poem. I'm just going to say that straight out. I don't know where it came from. I didn't know where it was going when I wrote it. And then people seem to feel like it had something that made sense to them, not just to me. So that was great. So think of it as like a collage or like a like a mixtape, except yeah. it's samples, right? Samples throughout. Brood. So the quotation it starts with is, scientists discovered over 1,000 female octopi, many brooding eggs in a shimmering octopus garden. And that was from a National Geographic article. Out there, Two miles below the surface, octopuses, hundreds nestled in a rocky outcrop at the base of an underwater mountain. In footage from a remote controlled submersible, they take the shape of Fabergé eggs, their bodies inverted, undersides exposed, arms draped like filigree down the contours of their pewter heads. Octopus Garden is a Beatles song written by Ringo Starr under his birth name, Richard Starkey. George Harrison, seen in a documentary helping Starr work the song out on the piano, later insisted it's Ringo's song. It's the second song he's ever written, mind you, and it's lovely. Cephalopod, likely Musoctopus robustus. The inside out pose is common among females protecting their growing young. To brood, verb, of a fish, frog, or invertebrate. To hold developing eggs in the body of a bird, to sit on eggs, to hatch them. Of a human, to think deeply about something that makes one unhappy. The idea for the song came to star on Peter Sellers' boat in 1968. He had asked for fish and chips for lunch, but got squid instead. It's okay, he said, a bit rubbery, tasted like chicken. The captain told star octopuses travel along the sea floor, picking up stones and shiny objects for their gardens. Star would later admit the song was further inspired by his desire to escape mounting hostility among the Beatles. I just wanted to be under the sea too, he said. Brooding, adjective, darkly somber, a brooding landscape, a quiet brooding atmosphere, brooding violent images reminiscent of film noir. According to scientist Chad King, the water appeared to shimmer in places where the octopuses concentrated, like an oasis or a heat wave off the pavement. Warmth, says King, may be seeping out of the sea mount, creating optimum conditions for incubation. It definitely looked like the octopuses wanted to be there. Brooding, adjective. Moodily or sullenly thoughtful or serious, a brooding genius, a brooding embittered man. The song gets very deep into the listener's consciousness, Harrison explained, because it's so peaceful. Ringo is writing comic songs these days without even realizing it. Do not mistake the exposed pink star of my center for vulnerability. Try it, you will regret it. Their arms, cocked and ready, appear to say. The discovery came just months after scientists reported the only other nursery on record. I would have sworn our observations were a once in a lifetime opportunity, said biologist Janet Voigt. Makes me think there's a lot more places like this than I ever dared imagine. Brood, noun, a family of animals produced at one hatching, a brood of chips, a brood of pups, cinnamon, synonyms, offsprings, progeny, young. The submersible's camera spotted tiny embryos cradled in their mother's arms. 
If you look closely, you can just make out the eye of a developing embryo, which means these eggs are doing very well, it says Voight, or at least that one is. The song, which contains the lyrics, oh, what a joy for every girl and boy, knowing they're happy and they're safe, is sometimes thought of as a children's ditty. Fact. The track required 32 takes before the band was satisfied. Fact, it was the last song the Beatles released with Ringo on lead vocals. Fact, it has been performed by the Muppets in several episodes of their shows. <laughs> they turn themselves inside out to protect their young. I tell my wife over dinner as our kids play catch in the backyard. October smoke paints the sunset, every shade of orange, purple, pink. Thousands of expectant mothers congregated, brooding. Not everyone agrees the shimmering indicates heat, though Voigt confirmed the first garden did indeed have a warm fluid billowing up from the seafloor. Bruce Robeson counters, it's unlikely there's any heat involved. He posits a seepage of methane gas. Says Voigt, this observation is further proof we have no idea what's going on in the deep sea. So yeah, you stuck with that the whole way, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually read that one because it, kind of goes all over the place. And sometimes when you're not reading it on the page, it's hard to track like all the places it goes. Um, but the question was what inspired it? Was it the quotation from, from the article I was reading? And it was actually the image of these octopuses. It, look it up. It's like, it's just stunning. Um, and that there are so many of them and that these scientists who you know purport to know everything did not know they were there. Um, the other layers of like of it being all of these mother octopuses protecting their young. I mean, it was just there were so many levels. And then kind of what I probably should have prefaced is that Ringo Starr was always kind of okay. Don't fight me on this if you're a Beatles fan, but it was always kind of the, like the throwaway Beatle, like the joke Beatle. He was. He kind of got slapped around. Um, and that song is really sung in preschools everywhere. So it's like, oh yeah, it was a super spiritual song. <laughs> so I was playing around with all of that. And uh, it all just came, kind of came together. And largely the concern for children and the irony of that, oh, what a joy for every girl and boy knowing they're happy and they're safe when BS, no, they're not. <laughs> uh, we know way too much about what happens to too many children um, across the globe. So. Um, that's where that was coming from. Um, I'm feeling like I should reel it back in and do something more re relatable than Octopi. And do you know how smart they are? Have you seen yeah. this? It's freaking crazy, right? Like you can put an octopus in a jar, screw the lid shut, and it will get out of the jar on its own. And then there was this story in this lab. See, this is where my brain is, right? There was a story about, do you know about the, the octopus that was stealing crabs? in a lab. So in a science lab, there was an octopus in one um, aquarium and there are crabs in another aquarium. And the research people who were going into the lab every day, like they kept walking in and the crabs were gone. It was like crab shells, right? And they're like, somebody's stealing the crab and taking them home and cooking them. Like what the hell is going on? So they set up cameras. You can also find this on YouTube. And I know it's true because it's on YouTube. Um, but the, the octopus was getting out of its aquarium, slapping itself down on the floor, coming up and over, getting into the crab aquarium, eating the crab, going back, and then covering its aquarium back up. Do you not think they're going to try to take over the world now that you know there are thousands of them just waiting, or just multiplying on the seafloor? So how do you not like sit around and want to make something out of that? Right? It's just too much. I know the book. I don't remember exactly what it's for, something about Octopi, but it was the whole book about how complex the neurosystem is. They are wild. Yeah. And it was written by a neuroscientist, so she was delving must, into yeah. how evolved they are. Yeah, they're wild. Yeah. They're wild. They also can lose a limb and, uh, wait, no, that's not, I'm sorry, that's sea stars. A, a sea star can lose a limb and grow it back. 
Kind of crazy. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> how about love poems? Let's go there. Yeah, me too. But really, if I could come back to something, I think I want to be an octopus. I think that would be super cool. I would steal all the crab. <laughs> uh, let's find the love poems. Okay. So this is a a poem I wrote for my wife. Uh, oh, I have to explain quantum entanglement. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I love nature and I get super fascinated by things that happen in the world. Um, but uh, my very, can anybody explain quantum entanglement better than I can? A non-scientist who just thinks it's cool. Like, uh, okay, the poet version of quantum entanglement is this idea that if two particles in the universe interact with each other, they will forever influence each other. So one could be, you know, a million miles away and it might start turning in one direction and the other one, even though they are no longer connected to each other, starts turning in the opposite direction. How do you not write a poem about that? Tell me, right? I mean, don't we all have those people in our lives? So um, my wife is one of those people. Dissertation on quantum entanglement as a love song. I whispered your name in a napkin, crumpled it into my palm, and opened an empty hand. I poured our story in a coffee mug and buried it in the weeds behind the park bench. A love so secret, I refused to tell it, even to myself. I dreamed we kissed in the cafeteria line while the steward looked away. I sang you loudly in my empty car, mountain storms licking the roads. Stay home, the ocean, who never lies, told me, so I did. Runner, I imagined your words, my words, becoming the beat in your ears. I dreamed your shoes beneath my bed, your wet pink tenderness, your shimmer like water held at the brink of overspilling the cup. The sun, who is always right, aimed her compass point at my chest and said, wait, you'll be amazed. Years gone, your scent woven through the cables of a thrift shop sweater. I wished you well under the changing colors of a sour wood tree. Your words arrived, not like a dam break, more like a rhythm I had never noticed pulsing in my throat. Please stick with love poem. Everybody got all calm and dreamy. <laughs> Open. How the honeybee flies ever more frantically against the stream this morning. How the one star casts its light 93 million miles to touch your face. This is what I'm talking about. The love that travels all your life to find you. Open the sash. Sunlight and shadow shivering across your unmade bed. Your wife's a poet. She is, but she'll tell you she's not. Um, she had she writes beautiful poems that I get in my lunch bag at work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's God, amazing. <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, she writes beautifully. Um, um, any other questions? Maybe I can take some questions right now. I don't have a question. No question too know. big or small. <laughs> One is what defines a poet? This is an essay. That's because interesting. You yeah. talked about you like rare. Yeah, yeah. Well, and lots of it, lots of essays do that. It's it's less about the uh, writer and more about the genre. You know, it's less about the person and more about what you're writing. So um, I, my first love was poetry, which I started studying while I was in college. And, um, and then I realized that I could layer language in a similar way in essays. Um, some of my essays are more, uh, more like personal narrative and they're less poetic. But when you get into that realm of uh, creative nonfiction, um, then you're getting into that realm of, of essay. Like there's even essays called lyric essays and the lyric essays, often they're not going to tell you what to think, 
they're going to allow you to come to your own conclusion. So very, it's a, I wouldn't even say it's different from argumentation. I would say it's a different form of argumentation because I think even poems are arguments. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Did that answer it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about hearing poems versus reading them? You like reading them? Yeah. It could be. It could be a learning style. Um, I I also kind of wonder. Um, so I enjoy reading poems because I can go back and go back and go back and kind of like I'll get to the end of the poem and if it really resonated with me, I'll be like, well, how'd they do that? Or if it creates like a really strong feeling in me, I'm like, how'd you put that together? And I'll go back. Um, and the poems I like the best are the ones where I get something off the first hit, but then every time I go back, there's more in there. I love those poems. Um, I also like to hear them read, but it's a very different experience, right? Um, it's more like story hour for adults, right? And I love that shit. I mean, pretty much everything I did in, in preschool, I want to still do on a regular basis. So story time, I'm all for it. Yeah. I just wanted to add kind of like in contributing to this. Um, I feel like it's really different when I hear a poem. I like to hear the music and I like to read poetry out loud, but I don't think I really understand things until I read it quietly mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's a question. So we have this whiteboard there uh -huh. and all for the month of April, the students will create their own poem. And today, one of the students read this, all these poems and he said, well, they're not really poets. Hmm. What would you say to the student? <laughs> um, I have to do it on the board. I have to, yeah. Um, but okay, they're not really poems, so I would ask questions like, "Oh, what, what's the poem to you? Yeah, what does it require to be a poem to you? Um, oh, is that what you look for in poetry? That must be the kind of poetry that you like, right? Um, yeah." Yeah, some people think poems need to rhyme. I mean, like, what are some of the other assumptions about poems? They have to rhyme. Okay. Like, as opposed to, like, fiction. Just rhyming, that's it. <laughs> I, I think um, there's... All of the form, I think. Yeah, there's usually yeah, like some sort of a form, yeah. usually. It, you know, it doesn't go all the way across the page, usually. Sometimes it does. Um, but but poetry uses the line breaks as a as a form of rhythm making and as a form of meaning. Um, I like to think that what poetry does is it gives us access to uh, for writers, right? It gives us access to every communicable power that language has. So it's not just words and their meanings. It's like you pointed out, it's their sounds, right? So if I'm using a lot of S sounds and M sounds and those sounds that you can that you can draw out and they're soothing sounds, that's going to add a certain mood to the poem versus if I'm doing a lot of t right? A lot of those harder sounds. Uh, if you think about it, and I won't give you a list of them, but if you think about cuss words in English, they're hard hitting, right? They're spiky, those most of them, except for one. Um, <laughs> but it ends spiky, right? It ends on a hard thought, right? Um, so sound adds meaning, right? When you're playing with line breaks, there's a different feeling if you read the poems out loud, there's a different feeling between a poem that's full of short line breaks and long ones. We've got what we call end stop lines where you've got punctuation at the end of the line. Um, that that's a that's a long pause, or you can kind of surprise. That's an expected pause. You can kind of surprise people by breaking a line in an unexpected place, right? And then that's kind of jarring to the reader. It's very subtle, but there are more communicable powers to language than just word and name, right? Yeah, and it also can get your senses involved. Right? You, you see it, hear it, feel it, touch it, smell it, taste it. Did I just rattle off all five? Oh, I can never do that. I'm so excited that I just said that. Okay, all five. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that's, to me, that's why I love poetry. Um, if if I were a musician, 
Um, I never had the patience to loop learn an instrument. Um, that's another communicable power that you can add to language. I mean, music is a language all of its own in and of itself. Yeah. I just wanted to add when I was learning English, I would taste like to try to pronounce poem. You know, we were we had to do Byron, you know, these uh -huh. poems, and it just felt so good to pronounce these words because they just seemed dripping. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, we never really thought about that from from a language learning yeah. perspective. That makes a lot it's of much sense. Easier. I'm doing the same with French now. Okay. Because it's, it's easier to learn the language because you, you can comprehend the beauty of the language. Oh, I love French. that. Hmm. No wonder you're here in the middle of a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> well, around a whole bunch of words. We have a question on the chat. Sure. Um, from Christina Murphy, she asks, uh, my question is, how do you write poems? Do you write every day? Is mm -hmm. it on a whim, or do you have a regimen? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. So um, so I write not just poetry. I write essays. I write you know, personal um, essays and um, and some, some denser, more literary essays and that kind of stuff, too. Uh, so I, I kind of go in, in waves with what I'm actually writing. Um, I write several times a week. Um, there was a time where I had a, a more regular schedule, and so I had regular writing hours. And what I loved about that was at that time in my life, if I, if I wasn't writing, I was feeling guilty about not writing. I don't feel like that anymore, but I used to then. And if I knew I had two hours a day, three days a week, and I put in those two hours, then I didn't feel guilty because I did my writing work, right? So it helped me <laughs> with some leftover baggage that I hadn't yet unpacked from childhood. Um, now, um, I, I write several times a week. Um, often it's in the very early morning. Um, sometimes it's just because, um, you know, I, I mentioned, I think it was before I was talking to everybody that I, three years ago, I went back to school, got my master's in social work, and now I am a medical social worker, um, in addition to being a writer. It's, a, it's an awesome job, it's, <laughs> but it's a hard job in that I see a lot of hard things. I work at Children's Hospital in Oakland, and um, I, I'm in the pediatric intensive care unit, so we get the sickest kids in, in the hospital, right? So I see a lot, and I need to work with that, right? Um, so I tend to be writing down some of the things I'm seeing and feeling and thinking, sometimes just for myself, sometimes it turns into something, and then um, I put it out into the world. So often that's in the early morning because there's nobody else around asking me for anything, so that's my favorite time to write. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of, right now, rather than being X number of days a week, it's more... Um, uh, stuff is feeling tight and locked in, and and apparently that happens to me a few times a week um, on its own. I also draw. I'm not an artist, but I started drawing in order to work out some stuff, um, and I, I highly recommend that to people as well. You don't have to be an artist, but sometimes the stuff that gets caught in my system, um, I don't have words yet to get it out, so I'll just draw little pictures, and that helps with that as well. Cool. Often you'll find me on my lunch hour with my AirPods in in a corner of the cafeteria, <laughs> just doodling and thinking about my patients and kind of sending love to them while I'm writing. Go on. Um, I do, I do. Yeah, I actually I have a um. So I turned fifty five in January. And woke up that morning and was like, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna start a series of brief like snapshot type essays um, called 55 Days, and I'm gonna do 55 of them during the year that I'm 55. Three days later, I was like, What the hell was I thinking? <laughs> right? But here I am. So I'm doing this on um, it's on Medium. There's a publication on Medium called The Crisis Diaries, and that's that's my publication. I'm doing it only for friends and and you know anybody who's interested in my reading or my writing. Um, it's not behind a paywall. If you want to go see how I'm working out my shit, <laughs> that's how I'm doing it. That's where I am. Um, I also um, 
Yeah, it's funny the relationship between social media and writing and, and even just marketing and writing. I, I'm I'm in a I'm in a lull phase with it. Um I'm kind of over it. Like I don't want to hustle. I just want to write what I want to write. And if people find it, they'll find it, which don't tell any of my publishers that. <laughs> Like, wait, this, this is recording. Um, because I, I'm like, I, people will find it if they find it. I don't care, honestly, if a million people find my writing. What I care is that, like, it finds the person who needs it. Um, and that's all I care about at this point. I felt differently at other times in my life. Um, but I'm not hanging my hat on um, a whole bunch of likes. And maybe it's exactly that. Maybe it's sort of a reaction to this whole, like, living for the likes living for the hearts, you know, um, I don't really want to live like that. It doesn't feel good. Um, it's not, it's not beneficial to me. It's not beneficial to us as a culture. It creates a lot of anxiety. It creates, you know, it's, it's, it's deteriorating people's mental health to live that way. There is research. Um, and so I'm uninterested. And then what I find is that I do, you know, I'm on Facebook cause I'm old. Um, I'm on Instagram cause I like pictures. Um, I'm not on TikTok. Oh, well, I follow my niece on TikTok because she has really cool outfits. You know, like to see what she's wearing that day. <laughs> she's in the fashion industry. Um, but what happens is I'm, I'm connected to a lot of writers um, on, on social media and they only post their own stuff. They're like, oh, and it, it always starts like this. Um, I'm humbled to have a poem in such and such magazine. I am delighted to have a poem in such and such magazine. I'm like, is that it? Like, is that what we do now? Where we're humbled and delighted? It's like, hey, I don't know. It just, I haven't found my way to do it. And I, I did plenty of that. And then it just all kind of stopped feeling right. It didn't feel genuine. It felt like if people are going to find me, they're going to find me. Um, great. Um, I'm here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, sure. Answers and opinions all at the same time. Yes. So you work as a medical social worker. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just thinking about, you know, making a living as an essay poet. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And you write your poems and your essays as a way to work through some of your stuff um, mm -hmm. with your other job. Um, can you, have you made a living just doing yes. poetry? Uh, not just poetry, but just writing. Just yeah. Writing. So I, um, when I was in college, I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I realized I didn't want to deal with people's parents. <laughs> um, so I didn't want to be like an elementary through high school teacher. So um, I set my sights on teaching at the university level. And I did that for seven years and I loved it. Um, and then it was kind of time to go. And uh, I wanted to teach in the community. And so I started doing that, like teaching community workshops, that sort of stuff. Um, and then I concentrated on my own writing. So that transitioned into um, do, writing for money. Um, I was selling my essays, selling my books, that kind of stuff. And then I ended up kind of falling into a, a gig ghostwriting. Um, so I ended up ghostwriting for the last, before I went to uh, back to school, I was ghostwriting for probably six or seven years. It was lucrative. Um, and, you know, it was sort of, oh, okay, I'm paying all my bills now with, you know, well, my wife is paying bills as well. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. We live in the Bay Area, right? Me, yeah. Um, but I was, I was making enough money and making good money. And it was taking all my time. So I wasn't having time to write for myself anymore. And it boiled down to, I was writing books for rich people. And there was not enough purpose in that for me. And so I knew for a while that, I, not that they're not lovely people who I worked with. I adored all of my clients. But in the end, I'm like, really, is that it? You know, I mean, it's great that I could pay my bills, but I had always done stuff. I'd written uh, like issues stuff. You know, I'd written for the ACLU. I'd done all these other things. And then I wasn't. So um, th that's when I decided it was time to, to make a shift. And um, because my wife is somewhat crazy, she was like, sure, go back to school. <laughs> we only have two teenagers in the house. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can make money doing it. Um, and it's okay if writing and about, you know, if you, your writing is your art. Yeah. Um, 
and your work to pay the bills is something else. Um, in fact, I didn't have a lot of juice left for writing in my own voice, in my own words when I was writing for everybody else. So I think it's something to caution against. Um, you know, we touched the themes a lot about writing and drafting. Mm -hmm. When do you feel like if you're working on a poem, when do you feel like it's finished? And even now, when you read it, you sort of feel like. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay. So I feel like there are. I, I, other than the mistakes that I make when I'm reading, I don't purposefully change things when I'm reading. I, I will revise something to death. Um, when I feel like it's doing what it needs to do, I'll float it out in the world and see if it gets picked up by a literary magazine. Um, I'll read it somewhere and see how if it, if it seems to resonate with an audience. Um, if it keeps coming back to me, um, then like maybe I didn't hit it yet. You know, or I, I might feel bothered by something like, yeah, yeah. There, with, in every book, there's a poem where I'm like, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure. Um, but in terms of like knowing when it's done, um, was it C.S. Eliot who said that the poems are never finished, they're only abandoned, right? Uh, that's kind of how it feels. Like I move on to something else. I got what I needed out of that one. Um, I think it stands on its own. People seem to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have another question online, and it's kind of in the similar vein. It, um, it's, what do you do with poems you don't like? Do you scrap them or rework them or any of your pieces? Yeah, I have, I have a huge graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> I have a huge poetry graveyard. Um, but I don't throw anything away because I don't know why, honestly. Um, there might be some fun scraps in there. Um, it might remind me of something that I tried to that I tried to write that was a topic that was important to me. Um, there was one poem that I like pulled out of the slush pile maybe ten years later, and I was like, "That's what I was trying to write about." And then I could like I I had figured out how to how to make the poem what it had been trying to be about the whole time. But it uh, it might just be a nostalgia factor that I hold on to them. The thing is, there's always more words, right? Like, this isn't a gas tank. <laughs> it's not going to come up empty. Um, there are always going to be more words. So I don't feel super precious about having to make everything into a poem that gets published. I think that's fine. You know, words are, they're just going to keep coming. So. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And I was looking at the Zoom camera, not suddenly staring off into space when I was answering that question. <laughs> Uh, everyone asked the questions that I typed up. So, um, um, do you have any advice for aspiring poets to get poetry mm. Just keep speaking your truth. Figure out what your poetry is for. Is it for you? Is it uh, something that you know? Do you have things that you want to share with the world? And just keep doing it. I think the thing about um, people who continue to work hard at what they're doing, whether it's an art form or it's a pursuit of some other goal, whether it's academic or athletic or you know what have you, is you kind of get to a point where if it's the thing you're meant to do, you can't not do it, right? Like I can't not write. Um, if I could not write, I would have given it a long time ago because um, there are a lot of books out there in the world and it's, it's a grind and a hustle to, you know, to get published and such. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say if it's your thing that you're meant to do, keep, keep doing it. If it's doing something for you, keep doing it. Just keep doing it. I have two questions. Who's your favorite poet? Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> And the second one, like your favorite book of the year, last year. Ooh, that's not fair either. <laughs> um, well, somebody earlier, he had to go on shirtless for a very good reason and not because I'm boring. <laughs> you have the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like I'm sure it's class, right? Like his meter drop on his purchase. Um, but the Ocean Vong's book, 
um, on Earth we are beautifully gorgeous. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, there's a book I read that I don't think got a ton of attention when it first came out. It's called I think it's Confessions of a Black Aspie. I, I would change the title. That's the only thing I would change about the book. And I have a feeling that title was probably a publisher's choice because that's not how the writer writes. But it was a, a memoir written by a Black person who has, who has an Asperger's diagnosis or an ASD diagnosis. It's one of the most gorgeous things I've ever read. And it's just, it, it's memoir, but it is so poetic, or and it is so poetic. Um, and you just know that it's that you're reading something from a magical human being. So those are two that come to mind right now. There are like three others. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Can I ask one? Yeah. This might be, I don't know, maybe you don't want to answer this, but when you said there's one poem in every book that you're like, eh, yeah. know, what's the poem in this book? Um, oh, I can close on it. I can <laughs> challenge myself and close on it. Um, well, the one that I read in Americana, the part about the um, about the cardinal diving into her own reflection, drum corps, that one gave me a lot of trouble over the years. But, um, oh, I got, okay, I'll read two poems. Um, I'm going off off book here to find it for you. So it was uh, maybe I do have it. Mm -hmm. This is called "It Ain't Pretty." Before the miracle of symmetry and wings. That caterpillar spent days gorging and shitting, spinning webs. She would climb to the pinnacle underside of a leaf where she hung herself upside down, then peeled off her skin and liquefied inside a straitjacket of her own making. That's right. Before she released into full bore flutter and grace, what she left behind was a massacre scene. Um, and I think that one troubled me because I uh, felt a little obvious and I was a little bothered by it feeling obvious, but then I did, I think it's also butterflies are, so butterflies are our like symbol of transformation, right? Lots of people get butterflies when they feel they've transformed or if somebody like passes on to what comes after being the human that you are in this world, they might get a butterfly, that kind of stuff. Um, but so we're all, oh, butterflies are beautiful, but the process to get there is disgusting. They, do you know that caterpillars, here I go with the science again. Oh my God, I didn't even realize. <laughs> you don't realize what your obsessions are until you're in front of somebody talking about them. And it's like, oh, so that, okay. Um, they digest themselves. Did you know this? Caterpillars are digesting themselves. Ah, and then they turn into this like soup. And the only thing that guides them toward being a butterfly is this little imagical disc thing that they have that drives them toward that evolution, right? If you've ever gone through a huge change in your life, you know how messy change is, right? Like it's not like, oh, and then one day I spun around in a circle and I became a butterfly, right? So I wanted to honor that. So I don't know, maybe the poem's too obvious or maybe the, the butterfly metaphor is too good. I <laughs> think, you know, like it's too on point, right? Um, but I put it in there anyway, because I thought, you know what? At the time that I learned how dirty, awful, messy that process is, um, I needed to be reminded that you can turn into an awful mess before you turn into the next thing. So maybe there's somebody else out there who needs to be reminded too. So that was that. And then if I could close on um, uh, close on a poem called I made me think of because the obvious poems. There are I have more direct address poems in this book than I've ever had before. And I hesitated on that too, because um, you know, it's not a self-help book. 
right? I do write those kinds of articles, but that's not what my poetry is. But I felt like now's the time, man. Like things are falling apart and people need strength, right? And I think that strength comes from figuring out who you are and being yourself in the world and doing what you can do in the world that nobody else can do because you're the only one here to like you. So, um, so yeah, I just let myself do it. So this is one of those poems. Use your voice, the stone said. Their amber glow, the only light in the infinite dark. They unzipped her throat, removed the clay bird, and placed it between her teeth. May you feel loved by something greater than yourself. May you find purpose to drive you forward. May you burn pain as fuel to grow beyond your worst fears, she said, to anyone who would listen. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Can we just have one more round of applause? Um, and remember, there are poems to say if you want, and there's two cookies left over. And thanks so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Hope to see you next.